Hey guys, those communications, and welcome to my review of another flick sent to me by Bill Bon Jovi. Deadly Game. People are dying to play. Now, Deadly Game is a TV movie. It was actually aired on the USA at Network, USA Network back in 1991. And um, it's another update of The Most Dangerous Game, which is one of the oldest stories in the book. I think it was originally a novel, and then it was adapted for the first time on film in 1932 as The Most Dangerous Game. There's multiple different interpretations of this story. There's this film, there's, you know, Surviving the Game, there's Hard Target, there's, you know, a film called, um... Dominion with Brad Johnson. So there's a lot of a lot of, you know, different sort of interpretations of that story. And Deadly Game is just one of many. But I really enjoyed this film. I had a lot of fun with this film. Yes, it's a bit corny at points, but overall it was very entertaining. It was very enjoyable. Um some of the acting left a little to be desired, mainly Mark Singer. Yeah, Mark Singer was pretty bad in this movie. Um, but everybody else did a competent job. Um, the directing was solid. The story kept me involved. And, um, yeah, for a TV movie, it was pretty violent. So uh, they got away with a lot. I don't know if they showed this version on USA. Because they cut, you know, things like Halloween. And they cut, you know, when they showed stuff on Up All Night, they would cut things. So, or was that TNT? I think that was, was that TNT? Or was that USA Network? Huh. But either way, they cut usually cut things, you know, on cable. And so, but anyway, Deadly Game is a film directed by Thomas J. Wright. It stars Michael Beck, um, Dallas from Megaforce. Um, he was also in Battle Truck, I believe, which is also known as Warlords of the 21st Century. It also stars Roddy McDowell from, you know, the Fright Night films uh, and, you know, Planet of the Apes. You also have John Plachette, Mitchell, Mitchell Ryan, Jenny Seagrove, and Mark Stinger. And Jenny Seagrove is the actress who played Camilla, you know, uh, from The Guardian, a film I really enjoy. And it was nice to see her in, in a different sort of role. She plays, she's not a crazy chick. She's actually, she's a normal person in this movie. And I thought she did a good job in that role. She basically ends up becoming... The love interest for both the bad guy and for um, Michael Beck. And she also is one of the few participants in this deadly game. Basically, the gist of the plot is pretty much simple. There's a group of seven strangers, including a dancer who is played by, uh, who's played by Jenny Seagrove. Her name is Lucy in this film. Uh, including a dancer, a doctor, a teacher, and a disgraced former football player. So you have the doctor is played by Ronnie McDowell. The doctor is played, you know, okay, yeah, the doctor is played by a teacher. The teacher, I think, is played by, I believe, there's a lot more other actors. There's, maybe it's Michael Beck. He might have been a teacher or something. I don't know for sure exactly. Um, I know Soon Tech Ho was also in this as well. And the um, Mitch Ryan, I believe. Yeah, Mitch Ryan. He's in it. Um, so basically, these group of seven, these seven people land upon this island. They are because they were brought together... There's also a disgraced former football player played by Mark Singer. And they were brought together by this mysterious, you know, character named Osiris. And they are told that at some point in their lives they crossed Osiris and now they must face his revenge. But they don't know for sure about that because first they just think it's going to be, oh, we're going to pick up a grant for money for whatever reason we need it for. And so they go to this, this island and Osiris reveals his plan and basically sends them off into the, the woods and there's people hunting them. And that's basically just the plot. It's just, you know, these people, seven strangers, are tr have to unite together and try to help each other or die or not help each other. 
and maybe still die, but all alongside the way also pick up, you know, these red bags of money, which they can use for themselves. So this is the whole reason why they came here for, you know, to get money. And um, you basically have throughout the whole film, each character finds like a part of the the wilderness that has like some sort of setup which is basically just like it's, it's basically something that's there like you know props or something like that to show the to, to basically to base it basically is the structure for you know these series of flashbacks that tell what how these characters crossed Osiris and I like I like the I like these nice, these vignettes these really short sort of you know backstories I thought they were really well done. The first one is a Mark Singer his character is a disgraced former football player, and this was this is funny because well for one they decided to have Mark Singer play a teenage Mark Singer, and this is Mark Singer like in 1991, so he's like totally in his late 30s. Or older than that, and he's playing a teenager. It, it was just weird. And the friend of his is still a teenager who he ends up basically. What happens is he's drunk, wants to get in the car with with a girl he knows, and what happens is he causes an accident that crashes into a tree. He doesn't want to lose his career as a football player. Doesn't you know? So he basically blames it on his friend and Frankie. And he gets sent to jail, and so you. So basically, you think that the film makes you think that maybe Osiris is Frankie, but then as the film goes along, you you find out it's somebody else, and then the first person to die is actually uh, Mark Singer's friend Charlie. He just lets him die. It's just you know whatever. He just gives up on him, lets him get eaten by a bunch of attack dogs, and then you basically have the, then you have a more super series of stories of you know reveals. And um, the next one, I think, was of uh, Peterson's character, Michael Beck, and it's the strongest one. It's one where he basically, he, it shows flashbacks to his uh, time in the, in the military during the Vietnam War, and he asks this, uh, he, there's a friend of his that he basically asks, uh, he, he basically asks, I, for, I think, I forgot the guy's name, it's a, there's this particular name the character has but what happens is he got asked you know ask him because he's kind of a dick asked him to take a couple of other guys and go check out a hooch which is like basically a slang I guess for a sort of you know uh, tent or whatever they might have you know uh, Vietnamese insurgents or you know the you know what a Viet Cong and he goes and investigates it, and a friend of his, uh, you know, one of the guys who's with his platoon that he picked for this three-man group to go check out the hooch, he's looking at this box of drugs. He's like, look at this stash, man. It must be worth millions. And he's like, no, don't touch that, man. That might be booby-trapped. And then he's like, whatever. He disregards it and touches it. The whole thing blows up. The whole tent, the whole hut blows up. They get attacked. The Viet Cong from popping out of the woodwork starts shooting people. There's some practical blood squibs. Uh, and what happens is the uh, one of his platoon members, he basically ends up getting trapped underneath. Uh, he's stuck, you know, underneath one of these uh, burning, hut, the roof of this burning hut. And, you know, he's stuck down there because he's hurt and he's got blown up. And uh, Michael Beck is trying to go get him, but what happens is Beck gets shot a couple times, and he's he can't move. He, he, his legs are shot up, and he can't go anywhere. And it's it's really well done because you're like, man, he can't do anything. And the guy's like, help me, man, help me, Peterson. And it's like, I can't. I'm trying. I can't. And then there be a Kong or shooting everybody. So that it, you know, so he basically leaves him there to die. And then you find out that this this character. You know, the person he left to die in the burning hooch is actually still alive. And that's when you find out the twist, which is really not much of a twist. There's a twist at the end, but, but th that's different. But then you find out the true identity of Osiris, which is the friend that he basically, the, the platoon member he left behind in the hooch. And they show sequences of what he looks like later um, that are pretty good makeup effects. And what happens basically is the next story, I think, is the one that involves a doctor, a Roddy McDowell, and that's what you find out the story about 
you that's when you first see a glimpse of this character and he's all like scarred up and burned and he's trying to ask Roddy McDowell's character fix my face or I'm gonna kill you and he's like I can't do it I can't do it it's it's, the, the, it's very limited and he does it anyway but then that guy's still pissed off he spares his life but you know he's gonna get his revenge so to speak but it was really good makeup effects I thought for definitely for a TV movie definitely reminded me in a way sort of like the burning you know like a little bit like that and um, so what happens is in the next story you get you get, you, uh, get I think you get like a double dose of stories you get I think you end up getting the character played by Mitch Ryan you get a story where he basically sold his wife's life for his own life to Osiris um, then you also get uh, another story where you you get Soon Tech O's story where you find out about him and by the way the other guy Charlie who was the Mark Singer his story was part of Mark Singer's story because he collaborated with Mark Singer to you know throw this other guy into jail, which you find out is, I think, I think it's it's it might be the same guy. I remember correctly, he's the guy who went to the war, but he took on the name of his brother, dead brother. But either way, yeah. So basically, what happens is you see Suntecko's story. He's a yakuza guy. And uh, Osiris comes in, and he's got his rare sword, and they're playing cards, and he's like, okay, all right, you know, I'll give you this sword, I'll wager it, and I'll give it to you, but, you know, two conditions, you know, if I win, here's the two things you have to do. One, give me your organization, full power of your organization. Two, cut off your own head. With this looks like a knife is like cut off my head ha ah, with this you know so good luck you know and he loses the the match he loses the 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 game of cards and you know of course the Osiris is like come on I'm really looking forward to you know controlling your organization and he's like you don't control nothing you cheated and then he basically just confuses him from cheating takes the sword anyway and then the next shot afterwards is really well done. It basically it's really ballsy because he said, "I want to cut you either cut off your head." So then he had a sequence where you know Tsun Teko wakes up after you know a night of drinking or whatever. There's a note with the same knife that he was supposed to cut his head off with if he wasn't going to give uh, Cyrus his uh, his organization, and it, it's got you know. I promised, you know, I'll save you, I'll save you for last, or whatever. And then you basically see his three of his confidants, the guys who said, I can look at them and they'll kill you with one look. They, their heads are cut off, their heads are down on the tables next to, the, uh, you know, their heads are next to their bodies on this table. And I'm like, and Suteko is like, justifiably terrified. And I'm like, damn, that's some ballsy shit. So it's actually gore, it's gory. That's like three decapitations in one film. Yes, they're aftermath decapitations, but once again, good makeup effects for a TV movie.